Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Israel, welcome back to Kiryat Yarim. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Exodus story. Uh, you positioned us last time to look at two great northern sagas, that of the Jacob cycle, which we dealt with last time, and now with the Exodus story. In our conversation on Jacob uh, before, we spoke about the fact that uh, for the northern kingdom, we have two foundation myths. I mean, scholars noticed this uh, long ago, that there is the Jacob story, the patriarch is Jacob, and then there is also Exodus as another foundation story from the north. We'll speak about it. Why is it a northern tradition in a few minutes from now, of course. And there is also some sort of a competition in the north about these traditions, because uh, we noted when we spoke about Jacob the fact that Hosea, for instance, the prophet in the 8th century BC, in chapter 12 there, does not like very much Jacob presenting him as some sort of a trickster. Of course, today the two foundation myths are connected and they are also related to the south, uh, to the southern text, because uh, Jacob is harnessed into the triad of the patriarchs. So this is Abraham, the southern from Hebron, the region of Hebron, Isaac and Jacob the northern, but uh, Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. This is uh, a product of a later author who uh, assembles the different local traditions and put them together into one story of the patriarch. And then we have uh, Exodus, uh, which uh, is, uh, of course, also uh, important in Judah uh, after the fall of the north, I think, I think not before, but after it is brought to Judah and becomes an important myth, an important story in Judah, also serves the needs of the Judahite uh, authors uh, starting in the 7th century BC. In the beginning, these were different traditions, and biblical scholars today argue that the connection between the two big uh, now we can speak about big foundation myths of ancient Israel, not only of the north. One is the triad patriarchs in Genesis, and another one is Exodus. They are being connected relatively late in the uh, sequence of uh, events, of uh, scribal events, authorship events, that uh, at the end brought about the creation of the Hebrew Bible. When we talk about the the broader narrative of the Exodus, there, there are a lot of different parts that include the Exodus, the actual leaving itself, the wilderness narrative, the conquest of Joshua, which we dealt with before, uh, but also earlier the Joseph story. Are, are we going to focus in on one or more of these at this time? I suggest that we focus only on the Exodus story and the wandering in the desert and leave uh, the Joseph story aside. Uh, we leave the Joseph story aside because it is, the, first of all, it is a, a, a whole uh, independent block and uh, the background of the block is debated today in scholarship. There are some scholars who argue that the Joseph story should be understood on the background of uh, reality of the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC. Others suggest that the, jo the Joseph story is some sort of a diaspora novella from the Hellenistic period, very late, and that it was incorporated really late into the framework of the uh, Patriarch's uh, Exodus narrative. So we focus on Exodus and in the book of Exodus mainly, and then we focus on the wandering in the desert and especially on the itinerary uh, of the wandering, the names. Names are always important because if we can identify the places, the archaeology of the places can shed light on the background of the story. So we look for the itineraries, uh, especially in the Book of Numbers. Scholars generally like to seek evidence for the Exodus in the Late Bronze Age. Why is that? Yeah, we need to start by saying that this is, uh, those are scholars who follow the logic of the biblical text, which means that they accept the idea of a, a sequence of events and stories uh, regarding ancient Israel from patriarchs to Egypt to uh, Exodus to conquest and so on. 
So they look for the 13th century BC. They used to look for the 13th century BC, and this makes sense in a way. There is inner logic in this. It's not something that is an invention uh, because of several reasons. First of all, the most important perhaps uh, point to discuss is the fact that Merneptah, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, refers to a group of people named Israel in Canaan uh, in the late 13th century BC. We have already discussed this before. So if there are people named Israel in Canaan, the meaning for those who accept some sort of movement of people from Egypt to Canaan, the meaning would be that this movement should be before the point of Merneptah referring to them already in Canaan. So we pull back to into the middle of the 13th century or something like that. And this too makes sense. Why is that? Because then we have the father of Merneptah, who is Ramses II, the mighty big pharaoh of the 13th century BC. The name of the town of Ramses is related to him. So this also makes an inner sense with the, the story in the text. But uh, we, we don't stop there. There is one more, perhaps, uh, piece of information which is uh, uh, essential for those who seek uh, Exodus, the reality in the 13th century BC, or two more pieces of information. Uh, one uh, comes from archaeology, the wave of destructions in Canaan from the late 13th century until the late 12th century. So this is the collapse of late bronze Canaan, uh, which conservative scholars uh, have always uh, traditionally connected, linked to the story of the conquest in the book of Joshua. So this again sort of makes sense, though from an uncritical point of view. We will get to it in a minute. Finally, I should say that uh, in the description of Exodus, and especially uh, when we look at place names, uh, scholars were looking for some sort of logic uh, which uh, fits the 13th century BC. Let me give you one example, with, because we are not going to go into every detail here, uh, unfamiliar to most of us people. Uh, one example is the reference to Migdol uh, in the story in the Bible, and places which are described as towers, as Migdal, as fortresses built by the Egyptians are referred to in the famous relief of uh, Seti I on the wall of the Temple of Amun at Karnak. This is from around 1300 BC. So uh, it gives you some sort of reality uh, in the Late Bronze Age. And there are other names that were sought um, in the time of the New Kingdom uh, in Egypt. So all this package together at a certain point looked relatively convincing to set the stage in the time of the new kingdom in Egypt, and especially, specifically, in the 13th century BC. All right, so what's wrong with the package? There are other uh, cases in the Bible when a package looks neat, and then it, uh, it is not very convincing. Here we have several problems. The first problem is that the pharaoh is not known by name. So you should ask me, so what? The answer is that the Bible knows very well how to name a pharaoh. For instance, in the Book of Kings, after the death of King Solomon, they refer in the time of Rehoboam to Shishak, which means Sheshonk, king of Egypt. They named the pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty by his name. And then in the second Book of Kings, in the story of King Josiah, they have reference to Necho. They know Necho of the 26th dynasty by name. So here, uh, regarding Exodus, the situation is vague. The, uh, the author does not really know the name of the pharaoh. But this is not the only point and not even the most important point. From there we need to say that uh, uh, there is no clue whatsoever for Israelites in Egypt. One could say, okay, fine, so the Israelites were not that important, that there were many people in Egypt, Egypt is an empire, they have other issues to think about. This can be coincident, a coincidence. Uh, but it's not all. Uh, many of the places, we will refer to it late, to this later, uh, uh, in the story of Exodus can be understood also on the background of later periods in the history of Egypt, which means later dynasties, not necessarily only to the days of Ramesses. And this 
would explain many things. Also, there is no clue in the Sinai Peninsula for late Bronze Age remains, and except for the international road which connects Egypt, the Delta, with Canaan, but this, of course, is a different story. So anyway, uh, we are not in a situation to understand the big movement of people along the Sinai, uh, across the Sinai Peninsula into Canaan in the 13th century. But even more important than all this is the situation in Canaan itself. We know very well that starting from uh, the days of Thutmose the third of the 18th dynasty in the 15th century BC, Egypt controls Canaan very tightly. Canaan is a province, part of Egypt, and there is administra Egyptian administration in Canaan, and there, is, there are Egyptian soldiers, garrisons, in Canaan in certain places. And indeed, when we look at, uh, carefully at the Amarna tablets of the 14th century BC, there are places, spots where there is some sort of uh, uh, a problem uh, in Canaan, and they start sh shouting and yelling that they need help from Egypt, and they say to the Pharaoh in their uh, letters, uh, help us because otherwise you are, go you are going to lose your land in Canaan. But then the conclusion is send 50 soldiers or send 100 soldiers. The meaning is that the grip of Egypt is so strong that sending, you know, 50 or 100 soldiers well equipped and well trained can solve a problem. This is not a situation of big hordes of people crossing, you know, into Canaan and uh, starting destroying cities and this and that. Not only that, in the entire Bible, the Bible does not remember Egypt in Canaan. The Bible does not have any recollection of the real situation, the most important point of the situation in the 13th century BC, that is that Canaan is a province of Egypt. The wilderness narrative especially has lots of geographical details. Uh, do those details look like late Bronze Age Canaan? Not at all, not at all. Uh, the, the other way around. Once we look very carefully at the itinerary in the Book of Numbers and we look at the names of the places, because again, let me say that once we can identify a place, we can go to that place, look at the archaeology, and then understand better uh, the background of the story. In the itineraries, there are only four places which can be really well identified, and I want to speak about three of them. One of them is Kadesh Barnea, on the border of Canaan, so to speak. Another one is Etzion Geber, at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. And then we have the story of the crossing uh, of the kingdoms in Transjordan, and uh, Edom especially as, as a place. So here we can say that the reality is in the Iron Age, not in the Late Bronze Age. And why? Because Kadesh Barnea doesn't have anything Late Bronze in it. Kadesh Barnea is a fortress, an important place, related one way or the other to Judah, uh, uh, to Late Monarchic Judah in the 8th and 7th centuries BC. So the background is there. Yeah, Kadesh Barnea was founded before, but it was not that important. Before in the Iron Age, not in the Late Bronze Age. The same holds true for Etzion Geber in the, at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. There is nothing at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba from the late Bronze Age period, neither under Aqaba nor in Tel el between Eilat and Aqaba. Under Aqaba, there is nothing even from the Iron Age known to us, and there have been quite uh, a big number of investigations and uh, 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 probes, uh, excavations there. At, uh, at, at uh, Tel el between uh, Aqaba and Elat, the earliest uh, remains may be dated to the first half of the 8th century, but most of the remains are from the late 8th century and later. So we are again not in a situation of the late Bronze Age. So uh, the reference to these places uh, raised the possibility that the stage setting is somewhere in the Iron Age. The knowledge, let's put it this way, of the authors is in the Iron Age. The same holds true for Edom. Edom is not known as uh, a territorial entity in the ancient Near Eastern text before the time of Adad Nirari III, which means before around 800 BC. And Edom is important mainly uh, starting in the late 8th century with the Assyrian takeover, with the service that uh, the Edomites give to Assyria along the Arabian trade route. route. So the whole story of 
the Israelites crossing Transjordan and s meeting uh, kingdoms there, the same holds true for Heshbon, farther to the north, is not uh, a reality of the Late Bronze Age, but rather of the territorial kingdoms of the Iron Age. All right, the Late Bronze Age exodus does not seem to work out very well. Let's try to pinpoint the time of the composition of the exodus according to your scheme. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned already that uh, many of the names and um, uh, items in the background of the delta of the border of Egypt with the, the desert, with the Sinai Peninsula, can be understood also on the background of later periods and later uh, uh, phases of relationship of Egypt with the, the territories to its east, uh, Sinai and Canaan. And indeed, here I wish to refer to the theory that was raised by uh, one of your teachers, uh, Donald Redford, an Egy Egyptologist, a great scholar, who many years ago, 25 and more years ago, suggested to look carefully at uh, what we know about Egypt and the Delta in the 7th and 6th centuries BC as the background to the story in the Bible uh, in the time of the Sai dynasty. The Sai dynasty, the 26th dynasty in Egypt, they also, for them, it was also important to be active in the Delta and they had concerns about the border with the desert in Canaan. The reason is that this is the time when uh, Assyria is, pull out, is pulling out of, uh, pulls out from Canaan. And in fact, in an orderly way, Egypt is replacing Assyria because Egypt is now on the side of Assyria because of another threat in the north, the Babylonians. So the geopolitics here shifts and Egypt and Assyria are on the same side and we are looking at Egypt of the 26th dynasty. They build their uh, uh, capital in the delta, size, and this is why they are called the Sai dynasty. We know that they are active also in construction of uh, fortresses and other projects on the side of uh, the eastern side of the delta, on the border with the, the desert, with the Sinai Peninsula. And uh, Redford convincingly showed that many of the names and places can also be, including, for instance, Pitom, as the other uh, city built by the Israelites in Egypt. Many of these places can be very well understood on the background of the time of the Sai dynasty, rather than the Late Bronze Age. And I think uh, that this is a good idea because of several reasons. Because once we uh, go down the centuries from the Late Bronze Age to the 7th century and into the 6th, in the, the time of the Sai Dynasty, we are also good with the itineraries. Because then we unite with the Iron Age background of places such as Kadesh Barnea and Etzion Geber and the situation in Transjordan. Not only that, I think it's also, mm, it also makes sense because um, we are now close to the period of authorship of biblical text, historiographic text uh, in the Bible, uh, in Judah, uh, in the late 7th century BC, perhaps also later, but definitely in the late 7th century BC. So the time of the Sai dynasty uh, is really a very strong candidate, probably the strongest candidate for understand the understanding the situation in the Delta, the background, what, what, what we can read behind the story uh, when we look at uh, the Delta uh, in the, and Egypt in the Exodus story. And some of the biblical texts talk about Judahites in the Delta as well. Yes, and this is another reason to uh, a look at the time of the Sai dynasty, I mean the 7th and the 6th centuries, because we know that uh, in late monarchic times, and more so after the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Judah, there were Judahites who migrated to Egypt. Jeremiah himself went to Egypt, and Jeremiah mentions Judahites living in Egypt in two places, in Memphis and Tarpenches. So there were Judahites there in the Delta, and they could communicate you know, these realities to uh, people in Judah, be it in the very late 7th century BC, perhaps uh, me even better after the destruction of Jerusalem. All right, it sounds like the, the tradition fits best the 7th century geography rather than the Late Bronze Age. 
Uh, and yet there are 8th century prophets who do seem to know something about the Exodus tradition. What you are telling me, Matt, uh, rightly, is that yes, the background is in the 7th, 6th centuries, but the tradition was not really invented there. There is a memory earlier, indeed. Exodus is mentioned and, and the wandering. They are mentioned in the prophetic uh, works of Hosea and Amos. Hosea and Amos in the 8th century before the destruction of the Northern Kingdom. And this is one of the reasons for us, all of us, seeing Exodus as a Northern tradition rather than Southern. This is always surprising for people to uh, comprehend because uh, Judah is in the South and the Sinai is in the South and uh, Egypt is in the South. And here we are saying that it is a Northern tradition and we, we will have to give an answer. Why is, there? Why is that in a minute? Uh, but yes, it is a Northern tradition. Apparently it is not known there were scholars, uh, like one of my colleagues at Tel Aviv University at the time, Yair Hoffman, who pointed to the fact that uh, uh, Exodus is not uh, known in what we consider as early prophetic works in Judah, but yes, in, in the north, in Israel, but there are other clues. Let me give you three examples for clues that we are dealing with the northern tradition. Uh, first of all, I think, uh, the re strong relationship that scholars noted between the story of Moses and the story of Jeroboam I. Now, Jeroboam I today is the bad guy. He is the one who is despised by the Judahite authors. We have already discussed this, but we need to be liberated from this Judahite perspective and understand that Jeroboam I was probably celebrated as the big figure in the north, the founder of the northern kingdom. And they tell a story. If When we dive into the details that are still left there in the story, both in the Masoretic text and even maybe more so a little bit in the Septuagint, in the tra Greek translation, uh, we see similarities between them. They run away, they find refuge, they come back. There are sort of uh, elements that uh, remind us that uh, Jeroboam first uh, personal story is not so uh, different than the Moses story. Secondly, uh, I would say pay attention to Elijah. Elijah is a northern prophet who is, uh, according to the story in the Bible, active in the time of uh, the later Omrides uh, and uh, into uh, the Elijah-Elisha cycle together into the time of the Nimshites and it was probably composed in the time of the Nimshite dynasty, that is to say after the fall of the Omrides, that is to say after the 40s of the 9th century, but he, Elijah, goes to Horeb, goes to the Sinai to contemplate. So there is a connection with the Sinai also for Elijah, who is an orphan figure, an orphan prophet. And then we have another clue. There are many more, but I wish to give one more in order not to make it too complicated. And this is what we know from the Mesha Stili, again, from Moab. This uh, inscription that was found in the 19th century, written by Mesha, king of Moab, towards the later decades of the 9th century, and referring to his own victories over Israel uh, with the fall of the Omrides, and speaking about the conquest of the temple of Yahweh, of the God of Israel, at Nebo. And Nebo is the place which is connected to Moses. So we have here again a connection Nebo could have been a temple that commemorated one way or the other uh, the Exodus tradition because of the Moses tradition related to Nebo. So all this package shows, that to the, shows us that uh, before migrating again to Judah, probably with Israelites after the fall of the north in 720 BC, Exodus was an important, one of the two important foundation traditions for the Northern Kingdom. Let's get back to the desert traditions, uh, the wilderness itinerary. How can you connect those to the Northern Kingdom? I, before we connect to the Northern Kingdom, I think that we, when we speak about the uh, desert itineraries in the Bible, and especially in the book of Numbers, which is the most detailed, I think that we need to ask a simple question. How could authors of the Bible 
in Jerusalem or even in the Northern Kingdom before, how could they know about places in the faraway desert? It's not, it doesn't go without saying. Pay attention to the fact that we, when we look at the geography depicted in the biblical stories, the Bible is always very accurate when it comes to the territory next to Jerusalem. The Bible knows well the Shephelah, the Bible knows well the highlands of Hebron, Bethlehem, the Bible knows very well the plateau of Benjamin. But when you go farther away, for instance, to the Galilee, still in the Greenlands, not in a desert situation, the knowledge is not uh, very solid. So this question should now be turned to the desert and it's even stronger from the desert. So we need to look for the reality. I would like to start from, to go here from late to early. It's a little bit confusing, but please bear with me. Late to early. Some people say, well, you know, most of these traditions in the Book of Numbers and so on, the Book of Numbers is one of the latest. It uh, was, uh, you know, uh, put together, edited, uh, redacted, whatever, around 400 BC, if not later. So we, look, we need to look at the Persian period. No way. No way. Why? I don't see a way that people in Judah, in Jerusalem somewhere, know about the desert, deep desert, when, where, uh, at the time when the territory of Yehud ends, you know, 20 kilometers south of, uh, south of uh, Jerusalem, not even goes, doesn't even go to Hebron and farther to the south. So now let's turn to the time of late monarchic Judah. There we can see a reality that people in Judah know about the desert. And why? because Judah takes part in the defense of the, the desert, the border with the desert, and helps the Assyrians along the Arabian trade routes. So Judah is well established in the Beersheba Valley, and we have even evidence, for instance, in the Arad inscriptions, of provisions given to uh, units uh, 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 maneuvering there in the south for several days. So several days can take a unit to Kadesh Barnea, for instance. Not only that, there are Hebrew inscriptions in Kadesh Barnea in the 7th century BC. So we are in a situation that the Judites are active in Beersheba Valley and the northern part, at least, of the deserts. They know Kadesh Barnea. They may also know parts of Edom and the head of the Gulf of Aqaba because the Assyrians used to uh, use uh, Judah locals as garrison in their fortresses, which means when, when we have a fortress like uh, En Chatzeva, south of the Beersheba Valley, or the fort uh, at Tel el at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, and we call these Assyrian fortresses. They are not garrisons by, you know, uh, 50, 60, 100, and 500 people coming from Assyria. There is maybe an Assyrian official there of the empire, but the people who garrison are the local people. So the Judites were there, and the Judites knew the desert. So there is a way to understand knowledge of the desert in the 7th century BC, in the time that Assyria is here, and also in the time, in the, in the several decades, after the pull, pull out of Assyria until the destruction of Judah by the Babylonians. Okay, this is all about Judah. I'm asking about the Northern Kingdom. What you are asking is, Israel, don't try to trick me. <laughs> Tell me about the Northern Kingdom. That's right. Yes, exactly. So indeed, the most important piece of information is still ahead of us. And this is the piece of information that connects us to the North. And I refer to a surprising and dramatic discovery in the 1970s, about 50 years ago, in the northeastern part of the Sinai Peninsula, at a site named Kuntilet Ajrud, which was excavated by the Meshel of uh, Tel Aviv University. And uh, one of the most dramatic findings, you know, in the 20th century related to biblical times. There is this small site there in the desert, 50 kilometers to the south of uh, Kadesh Barnea, in the middle of nowhere in the desert, a small hill near a well. The small hill is located along one of the uh, roads, routes, which connected the head of the Gulf of Aqaba with the Mediterranean and is known in Arabic as Darb al Raza, which means the, the road that leads to Gaza. And there is one building there. And we know from the 19th century already about this site, and there were clues also that there are letters in Hebrew. 
And this is why uh, the scholars were interested in this place. And there was this excavation and uh, many inscriptions were found at the site. And the inscriptions are on plaster and on stone and on ceramic vessels. And we can learn a lot from them. Now, radiocarbon dates and the material culture of the site both put Kuntilat Ajrud, that's the name of the site, in the first half of the 8th century. So we are again here in the time of Jeroboam II. Uh, we are again in the same epoch which, is, uh, which we are now discussing uh, in relation to Northern Biblical texts. And when we look at the details of what's in the inscriptions, we see that there are connections to the north, not to Judah. Although the site is closer to Judah, the connections are to the north, to Samaria. This should come as no surprise because at the time of Jeroboam II, Judah is controlled, in fact, is a vassal apparently of Jeroboam. We mentioned it already and we will get back to this when we speak about, you know, this site, Kiryat Yarim, uh, where we are now uh, in one of our future conversations. So uh, at that time, Jeroboam II, Israel uh, is strong, establishes some sort of a mini empire, manages to make Judah a vassal, manages to be active along the desert routes, to profit from the a lucrative Arabian trade and they establish this place they are possibly also established some, some sort of a fort at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba which is a different story. Now again the material culture and the names and the, and, and the texts are more related to the north where first and foremost uh, the God of Israel is mentioned in the text under two titles, Yahweh of Samaria and Yahweh of Teman. Yahweh of Samaria refers probably to a temple of the God of Israel at Samaria. So what do we understand from these finds? We understand that there were Israelites and probably also Israelite scribes because they write there, okay? So there were Israelite scribes, educated people, coming to Kuntilat Rajrud, active in Kuntilat Ajrud, writing these blessings and texts there, including, by the way, one text which looks like a literary text. And they are coming from Samaria. And now you need to use your imagination. They are sitting there, the nights are cold in the winter, and they are sitting at the campfires, uh, with the, at the campfire with the locals, with, let's say, the Bedouin of the time. And the Bedouin are telling them, you know, there is this place and there is that place, and giving them the names, and they are getting acquainted with the desert because of their relationship with the local people there at Kuntilat Ajrud. So this is exactly the time of Hosea and Amos, who refer already to Exodus and the wandering in the desert itinerary. So this clicks the whole thing together to the first half of the 8th century and it also clicks the connection to the Northern Kingdom. Is there any reason to go further back in time than the 8th century with the Exodus tradition? I think so because I think it's, it is not reasonable to suggest that the people at Ajrud, the scribes there, or Hosea and Amos invented the story. This is some sort of a strong tradition that comes from the past. So what to do? how to take the most important step back to the past, perhaps from the beginning of the 8th century. Here again, I refer to your teacher, uh, Donald Redford, who came up with a very neat idea, I think, and I will refer to it in passing because there's not much here to have in our hands, but he said that perhaps, just perhaps, the very idea of people from Egypt migrating from the Delta, moving from the Delta into Canaan, can be linked to an historical uh, process or events that took place in the Delta uh, in the Middle Bronze Age or in the late Middle Bronze Age. We know from archaeology that uh, Canaanites settled in the Delta uh, in the Middle Bronze Age, starting uh, in the 19th or 18th centuries BC. And they managed even to establish um, a, a dynasty in the Delta, ruled by Canaanites, if you wish. And at a certain time, the Egyptians managed to um, uh, rise with their own dynasty in Upper Egypt in the south, 
the 18th dynasty, and they took over the delta from these local uh, people who were Canaanites by origin, and they expelled them. This is the, the uh, terminology used, uh, basically. The expulsion of the Hyksos, because this is known from the writings of the Egyptian uh, Maneto uh, in Hellenistic times, and he refers to these people as Hyksos, which is a corruption of the Egyptian rulers of foreign countries. So just maybe a very vague memory of these events were there in the desert, on the fringe of the desert, and they were collected, so to speak, by the local people and collected by uh, uh, the northerners, the Israelites, who were there active in the desert. But this is not the end of the story, because then we are left with a gap of what, of uh, eight centuries or seven centuries between you know, the expulsion, quote-unquote, of the Hyksos from the Delta and the time of Kuntilet Rajrod, Hosea, Amos, and Jeroboam II. What to do? Here I wish to refer back to something that I mentioned already before, the relationship that uh, biblical scholars noted between the figure of Moses and the figure of Jeroboam I. Jeroboam I is strongly related to Egypt, as I mentioned, both in the Masoretic text in, and in the Septuagint. He ran away in circumstances which are not very clear. We read today the later version of the Jerusalem authors. We have to be very careful there and try to uh, verify that we know really what was there before, before it was sort of adapted by the Jerusalem authors. There was something there that he ran away to Egypt and he stayed with Sheshong I according to this tradition and then he came back and there are reasons to believe and we spoke about it in one of our previous uh, conversations that Sheshong I, Shisha, could have been instrumental in installing Jeroboam I over the, North King, the Northern Kingdom which means in the rise of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Now we don't know for how long the Egyptians managed to control the Northern Kingdom. Sheshong, probably yes, and there is even this famous Sheshok inscription from Megiddo, but for how long we don't know. Not for a very long period of time, because at the height of the strength of the Omrites, not anymore, but for maybe several decades, two, three decades, perhaps yes. And perhaps on the background of what was the tradition there from the second millennium, and the uh, on the background of the connection with Egypt in the time of Jeroboam I, and on the background of a possible liberation from Egypt of the Northern Kingdom when the power of the, no of the pharaohs declined after a while, perhaps there we have the reality to understand the very beginning of the tradition before Hosea, before Amos, before Jeroboam II. In some ways, the Exodus tradition is the result of a very long relationship between Canaan and Egypt. Uh, and yet we also see that during the setting down of the story, the composition, specific details of the 8th century get put into and structure the story. So in your own words, <laughs> let's summarize the complex history of this tradition. You're right, Matt. The Exodus story is probably the most complex story in the historiography of ancient Israel. It, it is the most difficult to decipher fully. It, is also, it has perhaps the longest history, starting maybe with memories uh, in the second millennium and continuing until uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem, until the Persian period, for many centuries. Now, to summarize, I suppose that we can say that there could have been a memory of events of migration of Asiatics or Canaanites or people from this land, from Canaan, out of the Delta uh, in sometimes in the 16th century BC. But it was a vague memory. This vague memory was preserved uh, in the desert on the bo southern border of Canaan, uh, somewhere there. And then later, there is another layer which has to do with the foundation of the Northern Kingdom, again with relationship with Egypt. Perhaps also some sort of a memory of uh, 
you know, the late Bronze Age. I doubt, but perhaps. But then definitely with Jeroboam I, with Cheshonk the I, and uh, this can be the first re really verifi verifiable moment in the tradition uh, in the second half of the 10th century with the rise of the Northern Kingdom. Becomes important there and then becomes even more important at Samaria in the first half of the 8th century, in the time of Jeroboam II, who on one hand is probably an admirer of Jeroboam I and connected to the traditions of Jeroboam I, otherwise why should his name be Jeroboam II? And he's also the one who is active in the desert uh, and probably the one in whose time information from the desert could have uh, been uh, uh, transported, so to speak, to Samaria, to the Northern Kingdom, to the scribes of the Northern Kingdom, and this connects well with the memory already in the time of Hosea and Amos, so we took another step. And then this tradition is a Northern tradition, and it migrates to the South, to Judah, with other Northern traditions, such as the Jacob one and the others, after the fall of the North in 720. It could have been preserved in several places in the north, at Samaria, because of the reference to Yahweh of Samaria in Contilator Jerud, perhaps also in the temple at Nebo, which was lost uh, in the ninth century, but in the beginning, in the temple of Nebo. And then after 720, it migrates to Judah and becomes also important in Judah. And the Judahites continue to know the desert in the 7th century because of their association with Assyria. So the desert is not alien to the Judahites in the 7th century BC. But not only that, one needs to ask the question, why is the tradition important now as a foundation tradition for ancient Israel to differ from Northern Kingdom alone? in the 7th century in the capacity of the pan-Israelite idea of the authors in Jerusalem in the late 7th century? And the answer could be that there is a message here. There is a message because of the situation, the geopolitical situation in the late 7th century BC, there was some sort of a looming danger of clash between Judah and Egypt because of the different uh, aspirations of the two powers, well, kingdom and power. Judah is not exactly a power. Judah in the time of Josiah, with this pan-Israelite ideology, thinking that when the Assyrians are, are out, everything can be fulfilled, by, but Egypt coming to replace Assyria, and they have their own ideas, and this could have been, at the end, also the background for the killing of Josiah by Necho at Megiddo, in 609 BC. So the message could be here, if there indeed had there been a looming, you know, danger, the message could be, well, look guys, you know, relax. This had already happened before. We clashed with the Pharaoh and because of the power of the God of Israel, we managed to defeat the Pharaoh and be liberated from Egypt already then. And this is going to happen again now with our pious King Josiah and the power of the God of Israel. And uh, finally, we need also to say that uh, this, there was another message which was important after 586. Uh, Exodus, well, it is also important today as a story of liberation, but definitely after 586, think about the situation of Judahites, ex-Judahites, sitting across the desert, but in another direction, in Babylonia, and uh, thinking about Zion longing for Zion, for Jerusalem, as in the song, you know, and, uh, you know, saying to themselves, well, 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 this had already happened in the past, that we were uh, enslaved, you know, by one of the empires, and we managed, again, with the power of the God of Israel, to be liberated, to cross a terrible desert, to enter into Canaan and establish ourselves there. Okay, great. We've talked about two northern traditions in the uh, patriarch stories. We have two more to cover in the coming episodes. One are the uh, heroic tales at the beginning of Judges, and the other is the Ark narrative, which will feature prominently Kiryat Yarim, where we are now, and where we'll be next time. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>